Today's story is about the dangerous job of being a law enforcement officer. I better get dressed properly if I'm going to tell you about cops. There. Does that look a little bit more like what you're used to seeing when you get stopped? I didn't actually wear these. I learned how to take them off. Uh, it helps me from stay out of court on tickets if I take them off and, and don't look like this. But I thought it would be fun for this video. Uh, let's talk about law enforcement. I knew it was a dangerous job when I first decided to make it my career. And even though I carried a gun for 37 years, I am very grateful I never had to fire it at a suspect or I, I was never really injured seriously. Today, I want to tell you about some stories about some of the dangers that I face though. I've been retired since 2010 and I know that peace officers today are facing much more serious situations than I ever did and it's because of the civil unrest. What you, people usually ask is, did you ever get a, uh, were you ever afraid? Did you ever um, get nervous or did you like your job? Well, Yes, I love my job. And no, I never really got so afraid that it hampered me from doing my job. But there were plenty of times that I was quite nervous. Most cops get nervous, but um, not many last if they are afraid of doing their jobs. And with good training and safe practices, you kind of just go into an autopilot mode when things get dicey. Of course, being nervous and uncomfortable is good if it heightens your senses and makes you careful. And if it makes you mean or take unlawful actions, then that's not so good. And maybe you shouldn't be in this line of work. Another thing that kept me relatively calm during crises times is my basic faith in a God and His love for us and me in particular. I believe we have an appointed time to die and will be protected until that time arrives. So here are some stories that um, could have gone either way. During my first five years I worked for a city police department that had three shifts. Um, one of the duties of the graveyard shift was to check businesses during the night and find any unlocked doors. Um, you do that both out front and in the alley and, and one night while I was in the alley checking the back door of a clothing store I found a door that had been forced open. Um, the first thing you always do in that situation is call for backup. You don't try and do it alone. Uh, one of the things I asked for it was a canine unit, and the duty sergeant said that he was busy right then, and he wouldn't be available for a while. And so when backup got there, we drew our, our weapons and started a search inside. As I searched the cell floor, I discovered a man hiding in the clothing rack. Um, another man was discovered in a, a closet. I didn't find him, one of the other officers did, but he was on the same sales floor where I was at. Um, the next morning, we, well, we arrested him, cuffed him up and arrested him, and uh, put him in, booked him into the city jail for the night. The next morning, I was assigned to walk over to the court for, uh, for their arraignment. The uh, county courthouse and the city jail were right next to uh, each other, and so when I say I walked him, it was just like from one house to the next. It wasn't a long ways. But as I walked him over, um, they told me that if they had had a gun, they would have shot me when they saw me come in. They were both just 
teenagers, uh, older teenagers, and be, they were going to be charged as an adult. But that's pretty mean thinking when you're just a kid. On another occasion, while checking alleyway doors again in the same city, I found a ladder that was leaning up against a business, and I could hear noises from up on the roof. I called for backup, but since only one person could go up the ladder at a time, I very carefully uh, climbed the ladder and peeked up over the roof. And I saw a man standing on the roof. It was a flat roof, and he was uh, using some tools, shovels, and, and axes and that, and uh, tearing into the, into the building's roof. Uh, so he could get down into the business. Um, I quietly walked up uh, closer to him and ordered him to stop and raise his hands and let me see what was in his hands. And then I ordered him to uh, lay on his stomach with his arms out and keep, and I kept my pistol pointing on him. And once the rest of the team had uh, climbed up and uh, and gave me the backup that we needed. Then we uh, searched and arrested him. And I have to say that that is one of the times where I was ready to shoot if necessary. If he had to turn around with one of those tools he was using, the axe or the shovel, and started towards me, I would have pulled the trigger. Um, and I'm glad I didn't have to. Um, but that's one of the times I would have. Um, I wouldn't shoot him just because he's a burglar. Uh, I would shoot him because my life is threatened with, with an axe or a shovel. Later, when I was a state trooper, I worked in both um, uh, on a major freeway and in a small county. And I didn't have good backup either place. And so I had to pretty much work alone. And when you Doing that, you have to be very observant and careful in what you do, because you don't have anyone else to fall back on. Once I stopped a speeding car, and I asked the driver for his license and registration. As he was handing them to me, he dropped them between the seat and the door. A lot of times I just shine my light down and allow them to get it. But this time, something told me not to let him reach for them. So I ordered him to stop, get out of the car, and secured him away from the car where I could watch him while I worked. Then I went back and I uh, opened the door and I looked for his license and registration and, and retrieved them from the car floor. And I also found a loaded pistol. He, um, I don't know what he was thinking, but think what you may, I personally attribute the warning to the Spirit. It wasn't my appointed time to die. On another stop where I didn't have backup, uh, st I stopped a car that had a group of four or five men uh, in the car. and. Once I got the license and registration information, I went back to check um, on the radio and write the ticket. I noticed that the men had gotten out and started to circle around my vehicle. At least that's what it looked like. And that made me really nervous. I really didn't know what was going to happen. And so I got out I, with my hand on my pistol ready to draw and I ordered them to all get back in their car. Uh, they obeyed, and I was fortunate they didn't have any weapons, or at least they didn't have any that I saw. At another time I would have drawn and pulled the trigger. Um, I don't know what their intent was. Um, maybe they, all they wanted to do was pick flowers. It was late in the evening though, They'd had a hard time finding any. It was in a, on the hillside, and there was nothing there but rocks and sagebrush. So, whatever. You know, there are a few other times I had to draw, but not fire a duty weapon. 
the one time I really had to draw, I'll tell you about now. I was sent to a small county as a trooper, and the, the county had had trouble with the trooper that was there previous to me, and uh, asked that he uh, be replaced, and I was the replacement. And my instructions were, get along with the sheriff. And so that's what I tried to do. And uh, one, uh, one time after I'd been in the county for a year or two, uh, we got a complaint from some people that were staying in a mountain re uh, rest area campground and that the Forest Service was in charge of. And uh, apparently a biker gang of about 20 or 30 bikers um, drove into that campground and told everybody they had to leave because they wanted to have the campground um, all alone. And they basically kicked everybody else out. Well, people called this, the, the Forest Service and they called the Sheriff Department and um, basically the Sheriff went up there and dealt with the uh, situation. The way he dealt with it, I wasn't involved with, and I was uh, unhappy with with the agreements they made. Basically, the sheriff allowed the bikers to be there for three days, and with uh, gate guards, armed gate guards, they both had pistols on their hip, at the entry to the campground, and um, they would only allow the, a sheriff officer, or in my case, a, pe a peace officer, a trooper, to drive through once every so many hours. I think it was once every three hours. And uh, for the, or maybe it was just three times a day, I forget. But when I heard those um, agreements, I was really uh, shocked that the sheriff would do that. He basically gave up all law enforcement um, authority inside that camp and he allowed armed guards to tell us whether or not we could go in and enforce it. Um, I didn't push the issue because it was actually federal ground and um, I wasn't sure of what my authority would be in there anyway because I was a state officer, not federal. At any rate, I came up uh, several times and, and checked to see how things were going. The sheriff department had a trailer across the street and they were um, keeping people there for 24-7 and deputies. And that was a pretty big job because the department only had three deputies. But uh, the sheriff would uh, take a lot of the time on his own. One time when I went up there, it was in the day, and uh, I went up to see how things were doing, and the sheriff was over talking to the two armed gate guards, and they were having a chug -a lug contest with their beer bottles, all three of them, and I was shocked. I'd never seen him, the sheriff, drink on duty. and. Uh, so I got out of the car and I went over to see what was going on and, and have a private little talk with the sheriff about the example he was setting. And I made the mistake of leaving my car idling. I did it because I wanted to hear the radio if I got called. And while I was talking to the sheriff, one of those guards snuck over and got into my car and picked up the radio and broadcast officer down and I heard it and I ran over there I grabbed him physically and I threw him out of the car and as he was going away from me from the car I put my boot in his backside just to push him faster and that was a mistake I shouldn't have been physical with him, but I was pretty unhappy, and uh, he turned around and he started to go for his gun, his pistol that he had on his, um, on his hip. 
Luckily, I had practiced for years in fast draws, and I had my gun out and on him before his was even out of his holster. And uh, he stopped when he saw it and saved his life because I was ready to pull the trigger. And I would have been in a lot of trouble if I had because of my physical assault on him to start with. But that one worked out okay. Now there's a couple of other quick stories here I can tell you. One was uh, in 1977 and the, it was on a DUI stop and I was the state trooper and I stopped him because of his driving pattern. You can see a drunk driver and uh, you can tell that something's wrong because he's weaving all over and not, not driving straight, driving too slow or too fast and uh, there's just a lot of indications. So anyway, I stopped him and from the minute I walked up, he was arguing and uh, uh, just to make a dull story short, he, I gave him physical agility tests and he, he uh, failed him. Uh, I informed him that he was under arrest and I was going to cuff him and uh, there was no backup there to, to help me do this. He got physical, he got verbally abusive uh, more so and he, um, uh, he resisted being arrested and being cuffed. I ended up on the ground in order to hold him on his stomach while he was laying on the ground and pull his arms around and put the cuffs on him um, behind his back. And that was the only way I could get him cuffed was by taking him down onto the ground. Well, we took him to jail, I took him to jail and, and after he sobered up he bailed out and pled not guilty. And if I remember correctly in his court case, his defense was that I beat him up. The judge wasn't convinced and, and the truth of it is I did not. I only used that force which was necessary. The second one I want, and the last one is a story that took place in 1982. By this time, I was a sheriff of, the, of that county, that small county. Um, it all started with a, a raid on a home in, in that county. A state narcotics officer that we had asked for, uh, he was an undercover officer, and he came in and he purchased some homemade crack. Um, and so we did the, uh, we got a, a search warrant and did a raid on the home and uh, took some of that crack substance uh, and it was analyzed and it was an illegal substance. And we, uh, at the time, we were standing by my car and I informed him that he was under arrest. We were um, not arguing, we were just discussing what was going on and why we were doing it. And um, I told him he was under arrest and I patted him down and, and uh, got ready to put the cuffs on. He was perfectly calm until I told him I needed to put the cuffs on and then he got mad. And he resisted our, uh, our arrest. He, uh, he wouldn't allow himself to be cuffed. He put up such a fight that another deputy had to help me uh, get the cuffs on. He fought and kicked and screamed all the way to jail. And uh, it was impossible to get, do any booking with him, so we just took him straight into the county cell, uh, into the jail, and put him right straight into the cell. And he was still fighting and kicking and screaming while I was doing that. Um, I tried to get him to sit down so I could get out of the cell. And instead of sitting down, he kicked me. And that started the fight all over again. And uh, sometime in, during that fight, his nose got bloodied. And uh, when I left, he was still screaming and throwing snot and blood all over the cell. And uh, the 
I called during a little later that evening and asked the uh, jailer, how are you doing? And she said, oh, there's snot and blood all over. And uh, he's still yelling and having a hard time. Well, I didn't ask again until the next morning. I came in to see how he was doing. And uh, he was meek. Well, he was sober, but he was meek and mild and, and willing to do anything just to get out of that cell. So I, I made him a deal. I said, if you clean your cell up, done it, then I will contact your county attorney and determine what your bill is. I did that, and he did it, and we uh, released him on bail. And he pled guilty to the drug charges. We didn't pursue any charges for his resisting arrest, although we certainly could have. And he moved, and I've never heard anything about him since. Well, that's enough stories today. Thank you for watching.